Okay, RG, can you hear us? Yes, we can. Excellent. You're ready to go. Thank and I can you. see you. Sorry screen. about the delay, everyone. We had some tech issues. Um, recording on. You already announced that. Oh, let me get this off. Okay, I uh, welcome you all. Apologies for the tech issues. It's not an event unless Lake is sweating. So uh, we are delighted to have the return of Jeff Deskovic to the Adelphi University campus. With his colleague, Oscar Michelin. Charles Herman, our president of the Criminal Justice Club, a senior in the criminal justice program uh, who is involved all over campus. I can't read the whole bio because it's been on time, but it's ridiculous how accomplished and wonderful this person is. He's also an intern at the Deskovic Foundation for Justice. And he's going to talk a little bit about the work he has done as an intern that you all have the opportunity to do. If you're interested, come see me. And then he's going to introduce our guest. So let's put our phones away and our full attention to Charles. Thank you, Charles. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you all for coming today to the Exonerated Course Confessions and Wrongful Conviction, bringing two notable speakers to campus, Jeffrey Deskovic and Oscar Michelin, to discuss with us these um, important issues. As president of the Criminal Justice Club, I would like to extend my sincerest gratitude to the Artivism Club, the Artivism, the Power of Art for Social Transformation Initiatives, as well as the Criminal Justice Program for their support and sponsoring with us in this event this evening. Your faith in myself and the club that I am president of is unwavering, and I thank you. First, I would like to talk about my experience at the foundation. Um, so. There are many different aspects of our foundation. You can work in the office um, as well as working in the field, going to different legislative events or different rallies with Jeff and members of the team. So every Saturday, I will go into the office and we will do traditional office work. However, each paperwork that we file or that we read, inmate correspondence, we learn something more about the legal system and about the how the legal procedures work. So it is a very educational as well as fulfilling experience talking through different cases with our internship team. It is important without us, there would be no foundation. Without us, there would be no um, exonerations through the foundation. I believe we have exonerated nearly 11 individuals, fully exonerated, three of them. So, and one of them that is on parole right now, hopefully to be exonerated is in the room. Ronaldo, stand up. <laughs> I had the pleasure of meeting Ronaldo this past Saturday. Jeff will oftentimes bring with him to the office exonerees or those wishing to be exonerated that are foundation clients. Um, and so we are able to uh, learn from them and their experiences to better the criminal justice system as interns and undergraduate students. I've also gone into the field in uh, to Harrisburg last semester to work with Jeff and members of the Pennsylvania Bikers for Justice, as well as It Could Happen to You, which are two coalitions uh, working to um, further um, better the criminal justice system. And so with, through this, I was able to work with them and to network with them to get better jobs and to maybe meet with them and see if I could have a job in this field uh, moving forward. So we were able to work across the aisle with both representatives of the Republican and Democratic parties to further a bill that would force Pennsylvania to pay those that are wrongfully incarcerated and found to and are exonerated because currently they do not do so. The bill would put forth $50,000 per year for those that are not on death row and $75,000 per year for those that are on death row. 
it is a gross injustice that people that are exonerated are not duly uh, paid for being in prison for crimes that they had nothing to do with. And so that was a grand experience as well. I've also been to the Bronx County District Courthouse where I firsthand saw Jeffrey Deskovic and Oscar Michelin uh, defend or defend a case in a 440 motion. Now I'll talk about the 440. The 440 is allowing for an evidentiary hearing. You can bring in newly discovered evidence. Whereas if you just do a traditional appeals process, you're not able to bring in new evidence that uh, has been discovered since your conviction. And so I was able to watch them and learn from them as they uh, go through the processes of this case and then learn from them about societal uh, issues and how to conduct myself at a professional setting at dinners or lunches. So we are able to also learn from them about those uh, experiences. So overall, my experience at the Jeffrey Desenvick Foundation has been fulfilling. I am going to be a graduate student in the Derner School of Psychology and General Psychology starting next spring, and I'll be continuing my work with the Jeffrey Desovic Foundation for Justice as a volunteer. And I encourage you to talk with Dr. Lake or myself or any of the other interns. I know Ishida, can you raise your hand? Ishida is a longtime intern of the Jeffrey Desovic Foundation. Carly just started. Carly, raise your hand. You can speak with any of these folks. Um, to get more information on how you can intern at the foundation. So now I want to introduce our speakers for this evening. Oscar Michelin Esquire has exonerated six people and is currently handling six wrongful conviction cases, including the Andre Brown case. His exoneration of David McCollum, 28 years, and Willie Stuckley was the subject of the documentary, David and Me, while Calvin Birari's 22 years was featured by the podcast, Empire on Blood. Oscar is an advisory board member of the Jeffrey Desovic Foundation for Justice, and It Could Happen to You, which has many different chapters all across the country. He was born in the Dominican Republic and graduated New York Law School magna cum laude in the top 5% of his class. It, he is also an adjunct professor at Toro Law College. Welcome, Oscar. Thank you for being here. Jeffrey Deskovic Esquire Masters is an internationally recognized wrongful conviction expert and founder of the Jeffrey Deskovic Foundation for Justice, which has freed 11 wrongfully convicted people and helped pass three laws aimed at preventing wrongful conviction. Jeff is also an advisory board member of the National Coalition Group, It Could Happen to You, which helped pass six additional laws, serves on the Global Advisory Council of Restorative Justice International, and co-owns the Recharge Beyond the, Restored, uh, Beyond the Bars re-entry game. Jeff speaks across the country and internationally on wrongful conviction, criminal justice reform, and overcoming adversity, makes frequent media appearances, regularly meets with elected officials, and, uh, and as an individual endorses political candidates who are running on a wrongful conviction, uh, prevention, and or criminal justice reform plank. He has spoken in front of numerous judicial audiences, prosecutorial groups, and spoken in front of, and spoken at district attorney offices, police academies, forensic scientists, defense attorneys, and as a continuing legal education co-instructor. Jeff served on the Peak Skill Police Task Force Reform Group, as well as on the tradition transition, excuse me, team of an incoming district attorney, helping to draft memos and recommendations for the new conviction review unit. His motivation is that he has spent 16 years in prison from ages 17 to 32, despite a pre-trial negative DNA test for murder and rape prior to being exonerated by DNA. He also is featured in the documentary short about his advocacy and life after exoneration conviction that can be watched on Amazon Prime. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you so much for being here. I'll turn it over to you guys.
Um, good, e good evening, everybody. By the way, I want to just thank Charles for, you know, that wonderful introduction and all of his work in coordinating this event. And this is certainly his first presentation in front of an, an audience like that. And look, for somebody doing that for the first time and being so gracious and acknowledging other people in the room and always do that, by the way, when you're speaking at a prestigious event and you, you know, you have the honor of speaking, but there's other people in the room, always hit the other people in the room with a quick um, tip of the cap. So for him to do that on his own, totally uninstructed. Hey, Charles, that was a good, that was very good for your first time. That was great for your first time. So as was mentioned, um, I spent 16 years uh, wrongfully imprisoned uh, in New York. Uh, my case happened in Westchester. Um, I was 16 when I was arrested and my wrongful conviction was caused by a coerced false confession, prosecutorial misconduct, fraud by the medical examiner, uh, terrible public defender. Uh, I did lose uh, seven appeals. I got turned down for parole, largely because I maintained my innocence rather than expressing remorse and taking responsibility. Ultimately, I was exonerated through further DNA testing, which not only reaffirmed my innocence, but also identified the actual perpetrator whose DNA was only in the data bank because left free while I was doing time for his crime. He killed a second victim uh, three and a half years later who was a school teacher and had two children. Uh, so my conviction was overturned. Ultimately, it was dismissed on actual innocence grounds, and the actual perpetrator um, was arrested and convicted for the crime. So tonight, tonight's theme is false confessions. And so my, I gave you the quick uh, overview on my case because I'm going to keep within the theme of what the what the event is tonight. So. Uh, let me let me discuss my let me start out by discussing uh, my own uh, false confession. I'm going to attempt to show the first slide, and I'm not going to succeed at showing my first slide. Um, help. Uh, I would be fine with using the mouse. Ah, okay. So I'm going to left click or. Oh. It'll be right click. It'll be left click. Okay. So when this, um, so I was 16 years old when I was originally, um, when this interrogation happened. So the year is 1990. We're in Westchester County, New York, and I'm a high school student. I'm a sophomore. Uh, Peak Skill is a small city, approximately 25,000 people in it, and murders were pretty rare. So when it created, when this murder and rape happened, it created an atmosphere of fear, rumor, paranoia and parents were concerned their own safety and the safety of their children. Um, I never quite fit in in high school. I kind of lived a double life, although I didn't quite, quite think of it that way. There was my life after school where I was quite popular with all the kids in the neighborhood, but there was my life in school. And I had skipped a grade many, many years ago and it kind of caught up to me in, uh, in high school. So I've, as a result of not really fitting in, um, the students in the high school told the police they might want to speak with me. So, because I didn't quite fit in. So that's how I got on their radar. I was a sensitive teenager. This was my first brush with death. I had an emotional reaction to the death of a classmate, barely knew her. She was in one, uh, one of my classes, uh, two of my classes of freshman, one as a sophomore, a newer name, new mind. That was really the extent of it. But I had an emotional reaction and the police thought that that was some sort of outward sign of my inner guilt. And then they got a psychological profile from the NYPD, which claimed to have the psychological characteristics of the actual perpetrator. And I had the misfortune of matching that. So a reinforcing factor. Um, so for about six weeks, the police played this cat and mouse game with me in which half the time they would speak to me like I was a suspect and they would push too hard and I'd become frightened and I'd want to get away from them. Uh, they would switch it up. And Jeff is this junior detective helper theme was developed which went over well because I was 16 and also because prior to being a teenager, I dreamt about being a cop. So that was how they fooled me. They used the good cop, bad cop technique, which one officer pretends to be a friend, the other's more aggressive. Because I had come from a single parent household and with my father never being involved in my life at all in any aspect of it. So I began to look at the officer pretending to be my friend as a, as a father figure. And in terms of this junior detective helper theme, they would say things like the cops won't talk freely around us. They will around you. Let us know if you hear anything. Stop in from time to time. 
They asked me opinion questions, congratulate me that my opinion was correct. Eventually, they got me to agree to take a lie detector test. They said, we have some new information on the file. We want to share that with you. That's going to allow you to be more helpful to us. First, though, you have to take and pass the polygraph. So the next day, rather than report to the high school, I went to the police station for the test because it was a school day. My mother and grandmother thought that I was in school, so they didn't call around looking for me. So they drove me, though, instead of doing the test at peak skill police headquarters, they drove me across county lines, 40 minutes away by car to the town of Brewster, which was in Putnam County, uh, which 40 minutes away by car. And that meant that um, I had no independent way of escape. I had no idea where I was. The polygraph was a Putnam County Sheriff's investigator. He was dressed like a civilian. He never identified himself as law enforcement. He never read me my rights. I had no idea he was a cop. They gave me a four page brochure, which explained how the polygraph worked, but it had a lot of big words in it that I didn't understand. But I figured, well, I'm here to help the police. So what does it matter? Let's just get on with it. Uh, so from there, he put me in a small room and gave me countless cups of coffee. Getting nervous. And he wired me up to the machine and then he launched into his third degree tactics. So he invaded my personal space. He raised his voice at me. He kept asking me the same questions over and over again. And he kept that up for six and a half to seven hours. As each hour passed, my fear increased in proportion to the time. And at the end, he said to me, what do you mean you didn't do it? You just told me through the test result that you did. We just want you to verbally confirm it. And of course, that shot my fear through the roof. And at that point, the cop pretending to be my friend came in the room and told me that the other officers were going to harm me. He was holding them off. He couldn't do so any longer. You have to help yourself here. Look, just tell them what they want to hear. You go home afterwards. You're not going to be arrested. So being young, naive, frightened, 16 years old, not thinking about the long term, I was only concerned with my safety in the moment. So I made up a story based on the information which they had given me that day and in the six weeks run up to it. By the time it was all said and done, I had collapsed on the floor in a fetal position, uh, crying uncontrollably, and obviously I was arrested. So that's my false confession. Let me show you some photos. Oh, I'm attempting to show you some photos. Oh, sure. Again? All right, well, right, but okay. All right, I really want to show this from the beginning, but okay, so is it possible? Okay, bingo. All right, so this is me in the courtroom. I'm really going to talk about false confessions. I just want to show some photos and I'm going to get to the main, main portion of my content. So this is me in the courtroom when it was announced that they reached a verdict, but before it was read, here's when I got the 15 to life sentence because I had been charged as an adult. Here's me and uh, I've been charged as an adult, tried as an adult, sentenced as an adult and sent to a men's maximum security prison. So this photo is shortly after I arrived at Elmira Correctional Facility, which by the way, um, I was there with uh, Ronaldo Clark. We actually knew each other while we were both incarcerated. Um, another picture here in the prison. Here's when I was uh, over conviction was overturned and is hugging my mother. Um, difficulties reintegrating, uh, opening the foundation. First person we exonerated, William Lopez, 23 and a half years. Um, did that collaboratively. He passed away after a year and a half of being free. William Hall, he with the red tie, eight years, four months, uh, which by the way, uh, Oscar Michelin was um, one of Mr. Hawley's attorneys and on the compensation side. Uh, speaking internationally, that was Armenia, getting an award from It Could Happen to You, which by the way, I want to acknowledge a couple of my colleagues in the room from It Could Happen to You that have joined us uh, virtually, uh, Kathleen Pape and uh, Gail Scarborough. So I want to acknowledge them as well. They're in the, uh, in the chat, integral members of our California team. Uh, our Pennsylvania our Pennsylvania team here as well, uh, speaking at a police academy, getting the master's degree, getting getting my law degree. All right, so let me um, let me change gears here and um, share some stats with us really quickly. Um, 3,822 people exonerated across the country from 1989 forward per the National Registry of Exonerations. Uh, coerced false confessions have caused wrongful convictions 27%. And the DNA proven wrongful convictions, particularly vulnerable populations are, uh, although adults have fa falsely confessed, particularly vulnerable populations are 
youth and people with uh, mental mental health issues. In terms of types of false confessions, they have what's referred to as the uh, coerced compliant. So that's when the person confessing is well aware that they're innocent, but they've been coerced into cooperating. There's the internalized false confession. That's when the person who is confessing momentarily doubts their innocence. Um, Long Island case, Marty Tankliff, great um, example uh, of that. In terms of uh, defending cases where there's a, where there's a false confession, uh, I want to say that it's uh, very important that you have to, as an attorney, if any of you want to become attorneys, you have to answer that confession. I think it's important. I think it's critical. I think it's essential that your client take the stand. You have to answer the confession, explain it. You have to disprove it through as many different pieces of evidence as you can, bring it all together in your in your closing argument. There is an 80% conviction rate in cases that feature a confession. In terms of defending a case on uh, an appeal, appellate level where there's a false confession, yeah, it's important to do all the normal case law on Miranda and however many other constitutional and state cases you can cite in the context of your argument. But I believe that a more effective way as a supplement to that, on the front end of that, speak the language of the innocence movement, reference some statistics. If you can find other false confession cases that have the same patterns as the case at bar, do that on the front end, have all your case laws to meet. You got a cup of piece of bread here. You want to end out with that. You want to put it in the judge's head. All right, the applicant, the, the appellant, you know, may be innocent. Even if you ultimately don't win on that issue, you might win on another issue, but they're not in a rush to let a murderer go. They're not in a rush to let a rapist go because they're assuming that since you're convicted, you're guilty, right? You don't have the presumption of innocence anymore. So even if you don't ultimately win on that ground, just the fact you made that and threw that suggestion to the judge, they might might be more comfortable ruling for you on a different ground, but you've got to pave the way for them to do that. Extremely important to defend your client in the court of public opinion, not simply in the courtroom. One problem that defense that happens in a lot of these wrongful conviction cases is that the defense lawyer simply says no comment, then the line of reasoning goes that I defend my, try my cases in court, not in the media. Yeah, okay, great. But in the meantime, the cops and the prosecution are putting out a different narrative. They're commenting, you have to fight back in the court of public opinion because what happens outside the courtroom often is just as important as to how the case turns out as what happens on, on, the, uh, on, on the front end. Um, in terms of uh, false confession experts, uh, very important to call a false confession expert. So in terms of knowing what the limitations are, so a false confession expert is not allowed to give an opinion on whether the particular confession is false or not. That's a jury question. But instead, they're allowed to share contextual information with the jury, with the judge. What are the factors that have been proven scientifically, social science, to lead innocent people to falsely confess so that they can have that in mind when determining whether that particular confession in that case is a false confession uh, or not, because that type of knowledge that's outside of the common experience and knowledge of, of the public and the jury's made up of the public. And to some extent that's outside the kind of judges uh, as well. So I would definitely mention that in terms of uh, reforms aimed at preventing wrongful convictions caused by false confessions, as I get ready to wind this up. Um, definitely recording, everyone knows recording interrogations from beginning to end. Uh, the false confession expert testimony, very important. Uh, but there's another reform that is gaining some currency, but only on the scholarly level at this point, not as amongst the general advocates or even uh, amongst the legislature, which is uh, a confessional version of a Wade hearing. So in a case where there's an identification, the judge holds a pretrial hearing. It's called the Wade hearing to determine whether or not the lineup is unduly suggestive. And if it is, then the evidence could, couldn't be used. So if we had that version of that on the confessional side, where a judge is going to determine whether a confession is accurate or not before it's eligible to be used as evidence, I think that that would be an additional, uh, additional step. In terms of red flags, that a confession may be false. Uh, and these are just red flags. Doesn't mean that the confession is false. It just means look very, your antennas and sirens should be going off. Your antenna should be buzzing. Uh, look, look carefully. A lengthy interrogation, particularly when combined with food deprivation uh, and or the misuse and abuse of the polygraph. 
if it's a co-defendant situation and they've all confessed, then if their stories don't match, uh, look at Central Park Five as, as a case in point, that's certainly a red flag. Uh, in Long Island, number of um, false confession um, induced wrongful convictions. So if the if the police stop the suspect and correct them and, and give facts, that's another red flag. So when out here in Nassau County, um, the John Colgate retrial with his co-defendants, John Restivo, Dennis House did so. Uh, Colgate was a 21 year old who was subjected to a 19 hour interrogation right out here in Long Island in Nassau County. Uh, he gave five different versions of a confession. Every time he got a detail wrong, the cops stopped him, correct him. Let's take it again from the top before uh, a sixth version was finally accepted. So if you see something like that, just like uh, if law, law enforcement is supposed to ask open-ended questions where a suspect has to, has to fulfill the blank, fill in the blank. But if they're just asking yes, no questions, it doesn't take very much to uh, say yes. Just like if a, a question incorporates an item and then that's regurgitated right after that, that's a red flag. So there was a Florida case I consulted once and the cops asked the suspect, well, what did you hit the victim in the head with? And shortly after that, in the dialogue, he volunteers, well, I hit her in the head with a tire iron. Well, that's an example of contamination. If you watched Making a Murderer, look at the interrogation of Brendan Dassey and the cops tell Dassey what happened to the victim's head. So that's that's an example. Uh, that's that's an example of that. If the external facts in a confession, uh, if the external facts are contradicting what's said in a confession, that's a red flag. I always like to mention a Selwyn Days case where Days did 17 years in a Westchester case before he was exonerated. So follow me on all this now. He said he broke in the side door of the house, but the house had no side door. He said that he kicked the dog to death, except that the dog died of dehydration, so testified a veterinarian. Said he left a bloody knife in the sink. Said that he, but the knife in the sink, knife in the sink had no blood on it. He said he brought his girlfriend to an abortion clinic after this double homicide, except that abortion clinic records indicate that that trip happened a decade before that. And he said he abandoned a car in Delaware, except that law enforcement never recovered a car in Delaware. So you see how external facts contradicting in a confession, you know, um, certainly start starting and stopping a videotape or audio tape, that's a red flag. Uh, what, are you, what are you hiding? What is it you did? What is it that happened? Those you don't want us to see. What is it that happened before the uh, video or audio tape uh, got, got started? If the level of language exceeds the life experience or formal education of a suspect. If you get the chance to watch the documentary, uh, Murder on a Sunday Afternoon, uh, excellent documentary, just you'll see this, the level of language that the cop writes this confession out on all these huge pieces of paper that remind me of like oak tag, they're that big. And he claims that this is the exact verbatim language of the defendant. And, you know, and the way that the defense attorney completely takes him apart on that it is just like nothing short of a work of art. So if you get a chance to see that, uh, I would advise you to do so. So the last item uh, I'm going to reference is pending uh, legislation right now, right now in the legislature in New York State. I, I want people to remember, take note, however you're going to do it. And I want you to express support to your elected officials of either party, your assembly people, your senators, that you support these bills. Unless, of course, you're fine with false confessions, but I doubt anyone would ever say that. So in, when the legislature passed the law in 2017, mandating that police videotape interrogations from beginning to end, the law unfortunately came out watered down. So the then governor came up with exceptions. Uh, he made exceptions for sex offenses, drug cases, and different types of homicide. Well, that's the cases we need it the most. And I, I'm pretty sure, you know, why is what why am I differentiate those and others? Is it okay to have a false confession case in that case? So that, there's a bill that's going to be introduced this upcoming session that's going to close out these exceptions. Now, bills that were introduced last session that are going to be reintroduced again, uh, the Youth Interrogation Act. Everybody got that? The Youth Interrogation Act, which is a piece of legislation, a proposal which have enacted would prohibit the police from questioning 16, 17 year olds or those under that age until after 
uh, the youth have been uh, explained their rights by an attorney. It would be a non-waivable right in recognition that people that age do not understand their rights. I mean, case in point, I was 16. I did not understand my rights. Every time the portion of the Miranda warnings was read, anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. I didn't understand what that meant. My mind went to civil court as seen by me on television. And I would think court, what are you, what are you talking about, man? We're not, we're not going to court. Uh, then there's what's re referred to in shorthand as the police deception bill. Everybody got that? The police deception bill. And that's a, uh, that's a law which, if enacted, would ban the police from using deception in interrogations, recognizing the fact that uh, deception, using deception, claiming to have evidence that, that doesn't exist, doing that during a custodial interrogation that's inherently coercive, you know, and so we need to breathe some life into the Fifth Amendment that you have a right not to incriminate yourself. And so these all these measures are aimed, again, at preventing wrongful convictions caused by coerced false confessions. Again, adults have falsely confessed, particularly vulnerable populations. Everyone should be able to say after me, youth and people with mental health issues. So that's my presentation on false confessions. I'm looking forward to the to the. Um, presentation of my colleague who's on my advisory board, who I've served as co-counsel, learning from him as a much more experienced attorney, but also having the pleasure of leading a few cases with him as my backup. So imagine practicing law for as often, long as this man has, and having no ego, being willing to have me be the lead just for the experience, but still backing me up for anything that I miss or need to learn, you know, um, who mentored me in law school as well from afar. So with that, my colleague, my friend, Oscar Michelin. Okay, so let me uh, put up my points here. Hello, everybody. Let's see where the, hello. Where, speaking of hello, where is the presentation? So let's see here. Should be on the desktop. Yeah, it's not hitting it. There we go. And there we are. Okay, so what I'll do is very quickly just kind of bring it to life and talk about uh, two cases that are working on the deal with false confessions. Um, oh, yes. I just want to start also by not only recommending that when you can, you in sure volunteer with uh, the Desk Group Foundation. It could lead to a job. Uh, I because she was a paralegal at my firm now because I met her through the foundation. So I don't know where, Professor Lake, if you want to say where the uh, Zoom is so we can, oh, here it is. There we go. Now we'll share screen. Can you back there? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. We're good to go. Yep, I got you. So, you know, obviously, if Jeff's story um, is not enough to let you know that this does happen in, in real life, um, we're dealing with two cases, one which we've already exonerated the person and one that is a foundation client, Andrew Krivak Jr., who, who I'll be starting a trial um, on November 7th, actually. Oh, that's Monday. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> in trying to exonerate uh, Andy. So... Quickly, just to go through David, um, David was arrested when he was 16. Him and his co-defendant, his best friend, Willie Stuckey, living in Bushwick, Brooklyn. And uh, David was, you know, kind of the, the runt of the litter. He had five siblings ahead of him. So his parents kind of had their hands, uh, hands tied, got into trouble, was a street kid, um, and got picked up for a, a case and uh, his appointed lawyer was miserable, was horrible. He ended up getting sentenced, him and Willie, to 25 years to life. And um, at the time of the sentence, the judge wrote on the sentence that they should never get parole. So Willie ended up dying in prison after 17 years. He got a prison tattoo, which led to blood poisoning, got no medical treatment, and died of sepsis 17 years in. Um, David ended up spending 29 years in prison before we got him out. 
So just to quickly talk about the case, you have to think about that in 1985, murders were going on all the time in New York. The crack epidemic really fueled a, a violent crime wave here in New York, where I'll put it to this way, David and Willie supposedly abducted a 18 year old white man in a white neighborhood. And he ended up dead the next day in a Brooklyn park and it didn't make the papers. Okay, so just think about what would happen if that murder happened today. It'd be all you would hear about uh, on the news. But there were so many murders, eight that very week, that they just never got around to even reporting on, on David's case. So the he was abducted at about 3.30 in the afternoon, forced into his father's Buick Regal, driven away by two abductors. Two young kids saw the crime. They described people who did not match David and Willie. The bodies found in Brooklyn, so it becomes a Brooklyn case. And this guy, Detective Buddha, was assigned to the homicide investigation. They found a witness who said that just before Nathan's car was taken, she was washing her Buick Regal. Two young male blacks who did not match David and Willie. Their heights were different. One was wearing cornrows. Neither of our clients had cornrows. They came up to her and they said, hey, that's a nice car. Being a New York girl, she goes, yeah, and if it's missing, I know how to look for it. She stared them down. They let her go. They went around the corner, and Nathan had a 76 Buick Regal as well, and they stole that one at gunpoint. So right around the corner, okay, so we had excellent evidence that the people who accosted Miss Hank must obviously be the same, very same people who less than 15 minutes later um, abducted Nathan Blenner. On a bad tip, David and Willie get brought to the precinct. They're threatened with physical violence. They separate them. They tell Willie that David confessed and named him as the shooter. They tell uh, David that Willie confessed and named him as the shooter. They tell both of the boys that if you just say you were there while the other one was shot, did the shooting, you could go home. So each boy thinking that the other one ratted him out said, well, you know, I ain't doing time for his crime. They confessed to each other. No one actually ever confessed to pulling the trigger. They both said the other pulled the trigger. They both described the shooting very, very differently. It did not match the uh, autopsy, but neither lawyer bothered even to cross-examine the medical examiner. So it didn't matter. So they decided to videotape the confessions. Back in 85, this was very rare. It's the first time the confession was used. The confessions took three and a half minutes, okay? So in three and a half minutes, basically the boys uh, threw their lives away. No written confessions. They didn't sign any statements. They just spoke on camera and answered like they, like. Jeff said mostly yes or no questions, provided no new details to the police. As a matter of fact, we tracked down the DA who took the confession and said he was scolded by the trial DA that the confessions were worthless because they were so quick and had such little information. So one this one guy, James Johnson, is what brought the police to David and Willie's attention. He was one for shooting up a bodega. He tells them that he heard that Willie Stuckey was trying to sell a gun that had a body on it. Um, so when you look at false confessions and you try to challenge them, you want to see whether they match um, the physical aspects of the crime. The one thing that we need to understand is that DNA testing has effectively proven that people falsely confess to crimes. And I know everybody here in this room is saying they would never do it Yes, you would. Under these circumstances, I'll tell you a story at the end. Um, yes, you would. Yes, you would. If you were told you were going to walk out that door and not be charged with murder and homicide, if you believe that your friend had just ratted you out, let, let's see if you hold up. But in any event, one third of all DNA exonerations, more or less, one third, in other words, DNA proves that the person didn't do it, confessed to the crime or pled guilty to the crime. Okay, so it's not an uncommon thing. So Willie, again, these are just some of the inconsistencies that their lawyers should have picked up. Okay. 
um, like I said, not only did their lawyers not cross-examine the medical examiner, who sh the bullet wound would have shown it couldn't have happened the way David or Willie described it. But we found uh, almost 30 years later, the investigator on the case who told us that the investigator lived on Long Island, the trial lawyer lived in another part of Brooklyn, and he would ask the investigator to pick him up on the way to court so that he wouldn't have to carry the, you know, his bags. And the investigator did. And he said that this man, who was at that time about 75 years old, every morning at 8 a.m. would be in his kitchen drinking a tall glass of vodka to steady his nerves on his way to the trial, okay, of a 16-year-old boy charged with murder. By the way, David had not had any prior um, significant crime on his rap sheet. So again, What's interesting, the way we ended up solving the case was that the detective who was in charge of the case saw that this woman, Miss Hank, had described people who had accosted her for her Buick Regal. Back in the day, there was a lot of car theft and it was not random. Car rings went out looking for a specific, a specific car or a specific part, like now they're looking for catalytic converters. Back then, Buick Regals were the fourth most stolen car in New York, very popular. So when she scared them off and got a good look at them, by chance, unfortunately for, for Nate Blenner, he was washing his dad's Regal and they didn't take a chance this time and they abducted him by gunpoint. So when Willie, who confessed first, when Willie confessed, he had this story that we stopped by this girl who told us you got a nice car. What happened is Buddha later realized that they don't match the description. One was 5'10", another one was 5'4". Both David and Willie were 5'2", five, uh, five okay? Excuse me, the other way around. One was 5'2", one was 5'10". Both David and Willie were 5'4". So they did not match the description. Neither of them had cornrows. So at trial, the DA, who's now a judge in Nassau County, by the way, and uh, Detective Buddha lied on the stand essentially saying that there was no connection between the two incidents. And meanwhile, they had a confession where the guy said, I did it, I did, we did both crimes. So um, all the evidence was there for the lawyers to see if they had bothered being detailed persons and not drinking vodka at you know, eight in the morning. So um, again, these are just samples of um, how the detective lied on the stand. For example, he said on the stand that I went out and I saw her and she said that she could not identify anybody and she refused to look at photos. But look at the police report. This is from Ms. Hank's statement. Ms. Hank stated she would be able to identify the males and would view photos, the exact opposite. I, we found Ms. Hank and she was at first very reluctant to talk. And when she finally talked, she said, this never happened. Detective Buddha never came out to see me. I never understood why people didn't come around. She knew Nathan Blenner. She said, I was waiting to get called as a witness at trial. Never called, never contacted until we found her 25 years later. Um, again, the DA was involved as well in trying to confuse both the judge and the jury. And he said, the woman who mentions braids is not even a witness in this case. Even though Willie... It's in Willie's confession. So how could it be that she's not involved in the case? The man just confessed. So if, if Willie did not commit that crime, then he should be let go right there. It's just obvious he could not have done it. So again, we, the DA even acknowledged it in the, in the appeal that they fought us on. We lost the appeal. This was the argument that we ended up making to the Conviction Review Unit. How could this be that there's a false fed fact, okay? One of the key ingredients to identify a false confession is a fact that only the police know that is in the confession, but is wrong and is fed to the person, okay? So that was what made me decide to take this case when I saw that that false statement was contained in Willie's in Willie's statement, it was not in David's statement. We have a lot of the same issues in People versus um, Andrew Krivak Jr. 
I can talk about it less because as it says here, we're starting November 7th is an evidentiary hearing and the trial starts November 14th. This is the rape and murder of a 12 year old girl. Okay, uh, her name is Josette Wright. And one of the things that Jeff brings up that's very important when people forget about wrongful conviction is that it means that some murderer is still out there or could still be out there. In Jeff's case, they directly tied um, the next crime to the same person. That woman would have been alive today, probably, if the police had done their job in Jeff's case instead of you know, railroading him. So she's last seen on October 3rd. It's treated 94. It's treated as a missing persons case. Her, her remains get found in the woods um, almost a year, over a year later. Um, that's Josette. So, you know, obviously you can tell how the jury's going to be very sympathetic towards, um, towards the victim here. 12 years old, seventh grade. She knew the defendants, you know, my client, Andrew Krivak, and his co-counts, his co-defendant, Anthony DePippo, uh, from the neighborhood. When the school reported her missing, her sister said she ran away. She was a bit of a troubled kid. It was a bit of an ugly household. And the mother claimed she was homesick when mom knew she wasn't homesick, but she didn't want the school to think that her daughter had, had ran away. Um, this is where she was found. You can see this little white spot here. That's the tent that's covering the crime scene. This is the road and where it's alleged that in the middle of a moonless night, um, our co-defendant carried Josette's remains into this part of the woods and came back down in less than 15 minutes, okay? I've tried it six times now. Um, at night, I couldn't go more than five feet into the woods because I thought I would get killed. <laughs> it was completely uh, pitch black. There's not a home around, it's insanity. Um, but nobody at Andy or Anthony's first trials bothered to, to do the same. So what happens is the number of teens get arrested for drugs, okay? And these guys were drug sellers, okay? They, would, they lived in Putnam County, which was close to the Bronx and upper Manhattan. It was very easy to get in your car, be in those areas, come back and bring weed, coke, angel dust, whatever, to the community that couldn't get it. It was a drug desert, like <laughs> food deserts. There was nobody selling um, Coke up in Putnam. So it was very lucrative to drive down, go to the Bronx, go to Washington Heights, come back up. And these guys did that. So the police, they were on the police's radar. They didn't like them. They also had another thing that they didn't like. They listened to rap music. And we've learned a lot from the depositions of these police officers about what they think about people who, as this is their testimony, listen to rap music, wear their pants low, don't have a job. This is their testimony. They are lesser, they think lesser than, okay? And so that led them to spot these two guys from the beginning. Eventually, they create a narrative where Josette is raped and murdered in the back of Andy's van. Um, by Andy Krivak and Anthony DePippo in front of four of their friends, including one woman who claimed that Josette's head was literally in her lap while these two men were raping this 12-year-old child. Um, everybody has recanted. One of them recanted that very same day, except one witness who still claims it happened. No physical evidence was ever found in the van, not a hair no DNA, no hair, no skin, no nothing. So Andy is then, after being sat for six hours, made to sign a confession. The police call it a confession. Uh, we will not call it a confession. It was never recorded. It's eight hours of custody. And he was told that he failed a polygraph. Now, who do you think gave that polygraph to Andy Krivak? The same guy who polygraphed Jeff, Dan Stevens, okay? So Dan Stevens was brought in to give Andy a polygraph because for five hours, Andy kept saying, I don't know what you're talking about. This girl was, I know her from the neighborhood, 
I would never have a 12 year old girl in my van. Like, unless her sisters, her, now she had sisters who were Andy's age. So like, if her sisters were with her, maybe I'd give her a ride, but like, you know, you're, you're insane. Deny, 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 deny. They then tell him, by the way, your co-defendant just confessed, which he didn't. He said, you did it. And also, by the way, you failed the polygraph. So Andy now said, Andy asked for a polygraph, excuse me. He actually said, you know what? How about a lie detector? I'll take a lie detector test. They bring in Stevens. Steven tells him he failed miserably. By the way, a separate expert read the tape. Same with Jeff's case, both Jeff and Andy actually passed the polygraph. They're told that they failed. Now that is enough to break your will. You think this is your get out of jail free card. Now the test tells me that I lied. I could, I could lose this thing. I could go down for this. So he starts distancing himself, minimizing. I didn't, I didn't kill her. And he signs a statement that Anthony essentially killed her. So how do we attack it? Number one, we don't ever call it a confession. It's a police coerced statement. It's not Andy's words. We're gonna show that it doesn't match the physical evidence, okay? Very critical. If somebody actually observed something and confessed to something, how can it be that their nine page confession contains nothing, nothing that the police did not know? Not a single new fact is revealed. It doesn't make sense that four people would be in the back of this van and then they left to take her into the woods. The one witness who said that she's gonna still say it, said that the two guys left the van with the engine running, with the keys in the ignition, went into the woods and came back and she still was in the van, okay? So she said she didn't think about taking the van and leaving or walking out of the van and running away. So a lot of it doesn't make any sense. Like Jeff said, probably have to call the client and we're gonna rely on experts. So two experts. Um, we have an expert on false confession who will talk about how age, minimization, deception, the failed polygraph lead innocent people to confess. There is science. People have actually studied this. They can tell you in false confession cases, known false confession cases like Jeff's, you see these things. They repeat. There's a, human nature is a pattern. So there's even a pattern in how people false confess. Something new that we've done is we've hired a forensic linguist. The first time this is actually done in New York, he will examine this statement and Andy's writings and the other statements, and he will testify that these are not Andy's words. Now, one of the things that I mentioned about this is because the reason why this is important is because how hard it is to overturn a jury conviction. Anthony DePippo was tried, lost his appeal, found new evidence. The conviction was vacated, retried, reconvicted, fought again, got it overturned, and on his third trial, proved his innocence, okay? It took us 10 years to clear David McCallum. Andy has been fighting this case since 1994, okay? Between these two experts, my firm has spent $65,000. So you have to be extraordinarily lucky to find the evidence, to be able to have good lawyering who can afford to get the top experts in the country. Dr. Leonard is used by the CIA and the FBI when a terrorist event happens and the terrorist organization sends a note a lot of times terrorist organizations want to take credit for shit they didn't do, just to get credit. Dr. Leonard testifies that this writing is the same as known terrorist things that they did do. And he has uh, helped with the 9-11 attack, um, with uh, the Oklahoma City bombing, and with major, major cases all around the country. So 
you know, we're very grateful that his opinion is that this is not Andy's statement. Um, but it's a monumental task to overturn a conviction. So we also attacked the case overall. Lack of police diligence. This was the first time these guys were ever assigned to a homicide case. They're not trustworthy. Okay, we have them on video beating up a handcuffed suspect. They got one of them got thrown out of the department for that. Things like this show the poor investigation. We have found the alternate suspect. Okay, they knew this all along and ignored a pedophile who lived in this little town called Carmel and raped a number of children in that, in that town. Two of them are gonna testify at this trial and describe how they were raped and tied in a similar fashion that these bones were found in the woods. We're gonna educate a jury about these issues because they're not something that people think about. For example, if you leave here with one thing, it's that because you take the Fifth Amendment, how many people think that if you plead the fifth, you must be guilty, right? We hear it all the time. That is, there is nothing more wrong than that statement, okay? Our founding fathers, as, as troubled and as sordid their past might be, they cared more about criminal justice than anything else, believe it or not. Out of the Bill of Rights, okay, four of the 10, go directly to criminal justice, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and the eighth are only about being fair in the criminal justice system. And the, the fifth, they wanted to make sure that a person could never be forced to testify against themselves, okay? It is the greatest protection of the innocent in the history of the world is our fifth amendment. And our, it, when you're out there and if you hear somebody say he took the fifth, he must be guilty, you've got to say something, okay? And we have to let, we're gonna educate this jury that that is the greatest protection of the innocent, okay? Had Andy just said the magic words, they would have had to have stopped. And now listen, police may railroad over that, right? They may ignore you saying that, but if you hold tight and you just keep saying lawyer, just lawyer, 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 I want to speak to a lawyer and don't say anything, okay? They can never use that fact against you and you can actually walk out of there if they don't have enough evidence. Uh, and obviously we're going to be, be very prepared and be attacked every single, every single point. But dealing with the confession is the hardest part because we have to get juries to understand that innocent people sometimes confess. So that's me walking David out of jail um, after he did 29 years, that's his first steps of freedom. He's wearing his prison jacket. And that's Jeff. That's me back there. Uh, when we got Andy Bale, he's now under house arrest. Um, he's been under house arrest for two years, waiting for trial. Before that, he spent about a year in jail waiting for trial. And we're finally getting our, our day in court. So um, the story I want to leave you with is something that happened last weekend, I got a call from a friend of mine who's a divorce lawyer in, in Long Island, very, very prominent firm. I know him and his partner very well. And he called because his partner is hysterical because she was shopping at ShopRite. And it's the store that she goes to all the time. It's out in Plainview. And she was using the self-checkout. And she had two cases of water underneath her shopping cart. And she didn't ring them up on the self-checkout. She walked out and a security guard arrested her for shoplifting. She tried to explain, she said, oh my God, I forgot about the water. She said, no, we saw you, you, you left past the last checkpoint. So you were trying to steal. She said, don't be ridiculous. Like, look up at my, look at my name, my credit card. You'll see that I'm here all the time. You know, I have $200 worth of shopping in the cart. Like, why would I steal two cases of water? They took her to the security office, a very small windowless room. Four, two security guards, the assistant manager and the manager started filling out forms. She started crying. They told her that, listen, you're guilty once you pass the point of pur purchase, the point of payment. So 
we're either going to call the police and arrest you, or you sign this statement that you stole these two cases of water and don't ever come back to the store again. And we're going to put your picture up in the security office in case you do come in. This is a highly accomplished, talk about Columbia Law School graduate, Columbia undergrad, a killer lawyer. She makes a ton of money defending divorce cases in Nassau County. And she signed the statement. She confessed to stealing two cases of water to get out of that room because she didn't want to take the chance that she would get arrested and she'd walk out and somebody that she knew would see her. And like many people who falsely confess, believe, I just got to get out of this room right now. Long as I get out of this room, the truth will come out. This doesn't end. So these cops say I can go home and then I'll explain myself and we'll straighten it out because I didn't do this. So obviously there's going to be physical evidence that shows I didn't do it. That's why people confess. Okay. It's a natural reaction to just want to end this pressure. And of course, I spoke to her the next day. She's hysterical. She doesn't know, like, why would she have ever done it? Now she can't go back to the store. What if somebody finds out that she confessed to this crime that she didn't do? And, and so obviously we're, we're talking to the supermarket owner to try to get her to at least come back to the store. Um, but they also, by the way, the law allows you to charge up to five times the amount of what you allegedly took. So she, they charge her credit card on the spot. And I told her to, you know, dispute it and, and we'll, we'll take it from there. But the point is it could happen. That's why we call it. It could happen to you. Okay. It could happen to anybody. So what are you going to say when it happens to you? Lawyer. That's it. Here end of the Okay, so, so I believe we're going to do Q&A at this time. So we're going to stay up here, Oscar, and uh, we will field questions. Dr. Lake, you want to chat? Just project your voice, please. And some kind of way, maybe your facilitator in the Zoom will be able to read off some of the questions from the people online as well. Maybe we'll alternate somewhat. RG, do you want to start with a question from the Zoom? I'm sure if anybody has any questions. Well, I mean, if they don't now, maybe they just put them in the chat and then Got any it. questions, you know, you can um, read, read them off. I mean, you could do it that way if you'd like. Will do. I'd also like to ask the audience here, if you all have any questions, just raise your hand. And by the way, everyone is clear, right? If the cops want to speak with you, you, you everyone's clear, right? You, you, you said you asked for a lawyer, okay? And you don't come down off that. There's nothing they need to say to you that's that important that can't wait for them to provide you with a lawyer. And once you have the lawyer, then the conversation can ensue from there. And that lawyer will prevent the police from coercing you. So I think I see in the back. Well, that's that's where a false confession expert would come in at, and I would refer, I would consider the linguist to be for uh, forensic science. Ask you want to add anything? Yeah, no. The uh, there's two ways. So the problem with the forensic psychologist is normally you have to interview the person. So some a lot of times you forensic psychology when you say the person was either didn't understand, had a competence level, or a mental disease or defect. Most of the time, the or, or for example, like it. Um, there's a defense of battered woman syndrome where a woman kills her, her significant other because he says in the morning, I'm going to beat you up. I'm going to kill you again. So forensic psychology does to explain those types of defenses. Normally in false confession, you don't want the other side to be then be able to interview your client. So you use what a social scientist to talk about the research. He can't say this confession is false. A psychologist would be able to say this person could not have, was not competent enough to give, to waive his rights, for example. So usually it's a social scientist who says, 
these are the common factors in false confessions. And these are the common factors that are in this case that match those, those factors. Right, but that's as far as they can go. They, that's as far as they can go. Yep. Uh, so I don't have a hand over here. If I may interrupt very quickly, is there a microphone maybe that you can take over to those asking questions in the audience there? Because from Zoom, we can't hear the question. All right, so what we're gonna do is, um, so Oscar and I are gonna repeat the questions through the microphone before we give answer and we solve it that way, okay? Perfect, thank you. Excellent, Th thank you for that point. Go ahead, question from the audience. All right. So the question is, uh, how long? Don't have a lawyer. If you don't have a lawyer, how long do they have? You want to field this one? Sure. So the you have to normally be brought in for arraignment, generally speaking, under the law in the city of New York, within seventy two hours of your arrest. It's not twenty four. So it's usually a lot less than that. Currently, you wait about fifteen hours. You do not have the right to speak to the lawyer or your one phone call, by the way, before arraignment, okay? So you see on TV, I want my one phone call. The constitution says that call is only supposed to come after you know what your charges are, because you don't want to call somebody before and say, what are you charged with? I don't know, and you've wasted your one call. Most police, 99% will allow you to make that call. So they have to, the first time they have to provide you a lawyer. If you say, I want to speak to a lawyer, it doesn't mean you get a lawyer. It means they stop questioning you. And so the first time you speak to a lawyer is at your arraignment, when you're brought in front of a judge and read the charges that following, normally that following morning. Right now in New York, it's somewhere between 12 and 20 hours between arrest and arraignment. Yeah. You sit in a room by yourself. Wait, wait, I want to just, yeah. I would like to repeat the follow-up yeah, question yeah. for your answer. So your follow-up question is what? I'm going to repeat for the audience in Zoom. So the question is, if there's a 15 hour gap, do you have to wait for the lawyer? No, you're normally brought through a booking. The question is whether the person stays in the interrogation room during that time. You're normally brought to a booking process. You get fingerprinted at the precinct and then you're held until there's enough of you that they put you on a bus and take you to the courthouse for arraignment. And then they have to type out your complaint. A DA has to meet with the police officer. If there's a complainant involved, they speak to the complainant. Your prints get sent to one police plaza here in the city. They get sent to Albany for state crimes, to check for state crimes, and they get sent to Washington. So back when David, the FBI Criminal Justice Center, so back when David and Willie were arrested, they used to do that by fax. They had to fax your fingerprints. And then they would search them through these old computers and they would get, sometimes you couldn't read the prints by fax. So people used to wait sometimes days. That's why there's a 72 hour rule. People used to wait days to see a judge. Okay. Now it's all done by computer. You just put your hand on a screen and they come back within an hour or two. Don't forget they have to check your fingerprints on three databases of all people ever fingerprinted, immigration. If you've been fingerprinted for immigration, you're in the system. If you were a security guard, you're in the system. Now, if you coach youth sports, you might get fingerprinted. You're in the system. So all those databases get checked now within about four hours it takes to go and have them come back. And then they have to type the complaint. Let's, there's two questions on the Zoom. So the first question is, why the pressure? What does law enforcement gain? Well, they close the case out in a hurry. Um, and what police believe they got the right guy, okay? They don't let that go. There's a tunnel vision there. And what's funny is if you talk to most law enforcement, and listen, obviously there's all kinds of law enforcement, but we're talking about statistics here. The FBI did a study and law enforcement uh, personnel believe that they are better at discerning the truth than the average person. 75% of law enforcement personnel when surveyed say, I can tell someone's lying better than the average person. Guess what the FBI survey found? They are worse because of confirmation 
bias. Okay, so there's training in certain techniques that have been now outlawed, the read technique and others that used to tell police, if a suspect crosses his hands, he's lying. If he won't look you in the eye, he's lying. Uh, if he stutters or he waits, he's lying. You can't evaluate those things unless you know what the person's like when they're not under a hot light in a windowless room for 15 hours. But that, those are the types of things that led people, the police, to think that they're right. So most of the time when you ask these officers, they don't think they're engaging in a wrongful conviction. They think they got the right guy. And everybody else must be lying. So that, that's a big factor. Yeah, so I just want to quickly add um, that the more arrests you make, you know, the more glory the more promotions, the more prestige on the police chief level, they often feel pressure to solve crimes. And so that, you know, things roll downhill. It could be on the mayoral level who leans on the police chief, sure. you know, and yeah, when, and just so everyone's clear, when Oscar was talking about, you know, illegal methods, the read technique is not illegal. Okay. He wasn't referring to that. That's, that's very much still in play just to be clear uh, on that. That's not what he intended to say, but it was all like yep. together. Right. So another question, um, Gail Reynoso, who's, um, again, uh, on the steering committee of Could Happen to You, California, um, has the question, uh, are defense attorneys obligated to request to withdraw a confession if asked by the defendant? All right. So this question is uh, this question is worded kind of uh, awkwardly. And but uh, I understand what she's saying. So you would you your your confession it's not talked about in terms of in that way it's not with that you're withdrawing it's that you're going to make a motion to suppress the statements that's referred to as a Huntley hearing that's in court and if you don't make that motion you probably you, you should lose your license I'll say that that's basic and and fundamental but challenging that does not mean that they can't use that as evidence. They're only barred from that if you can persuade the judge, uh, good luck on that one, uh, that the confession was either involuntary or that the suspect was not given their what rights or that they didn't knowingly, willingly, and intelligently. That's part of the reason why the reforms I talked about during my part of the presentation, we talked about Youth Interrogation Act, police deception, getting rid of exceptions. That's why they're so critical is because the reality of it is that trial judges are not, in fact, upholding Fifth Amendment rights. They're not suppressing confessions, despite obvious signs that confessions are false. If you look at any of the narratives on the case summary, on the Innocence Project website, website, National Register for Exoneration, once people are cleared and they write up that narrative, plenty of red flags along the way that a confession was coerced, that it should have been uh, kept out of evidence that the appellate courts should have upheld rights when the lower court didn't, but they didn't. Oscar, I don't know if you want to add anything. Here. No, that's it. the only thing I would, I would say is that when you go to trial, there's certain things that uh, you can do whether your client wants you to it or not. A client cannot force me to call certain witnesses, for example, if I think they're bad. That's the lawyer's decision. But a client can always decide three things. And the lawyer has to follow those instructions, whether they think it's good or bad for the person. And one is whether to plead guilty or innocent. Secondly is whether to have a jury or a judge. The answer is always jury. And the third is, should I testify? If your client says he wants to testify, even if you think it's the most back crazy idea in your mind, you can't not put him on the stand. Okay. So those are the only decisions that a client can actually force. So we say withdraw a confession. The client always wants you to withdraw the confession. Otherwise, they're going to lose, right? But you have to make this motion. And if they want to testify or don't want to testify, okay? The client says, no, no, I'm not. I know what you're saying. I'm not going up there. You can't put them up there. So the next question is, was it only recently that linguists were used? No. I mean, that linguists have always been used in other types of cases. Linguists have always been used in trying to discern handwriting and who wrote a certain phrase or, or, or an extortion letter or a kidnapping note, things like, like that. But with the advent of supercomputing, we now have databases, okay, that not only contain every word in the English language, but how often that word is used with other words. 
And what age, nationality, geographical region, level of education, gender, work experience, life experience elements like uh, social status, uh, monetary, uh, you know, um, class, and it analyzes whether this is the common phrasing that's used in those types of communication. So the supercomputing, the use of analytic of data has changed dramatically. So now we use data for all kinds of different things. And forensic linguists can now point out to the fact that, for example, a phrase in Andy's case, nobody ever would say this happened between two vacuum cleaners, which is a gas station where this happened. And they have those vacuum cleaners to clean your car out. All five people who allegedly made statements said that same phrase. This occurred between two vacuum cleaners. And that phrase has never occurred in the English lexicon um, before. And so it shows that that's a phrase that the police came up for this particular situation because five independent people wouldn't use that exact same, someone might say next to the vacuum cleaners, by the vacuum cleaner on the right, in the middle, they would not use the same five words in the same order where there are lots of five word phrases that people might use. Let's go to lunch, for example, okay? That's something that, yeah, five people could say, we all agreed, let's go to lunch. So that's the way that science has moved forward with the advent of computing. All right, so I want to switch now and get one or two questions from the audience in person, then we'll come back to next one. Is there anyone else that in the audience with us that has a question? Uh, oh, in the front. Question is, what determines what cases we take on and how does the process start? So the process starts, um, and you can answer this too, because you got you get no shortage of mail either. Um, so somebody contacts me, okay? And how do they contact me? Well, I'm kind of a legend in the New York State prison system is one thing, and I do a lot of media. So I do a lot of television, radio, print media, new media. And so every time I do a media appearance, there's usually an influx of letters that comes in. So that's how their friends and family of people who wrongfully incarcerated hear of me. They share that information with the person who's allegedly wrongfully convicted, and they start out a letter. So that would be where Charles comes in at. That would be where Ishita comes in at. That would be where Charlene Gachette, who used to work out here, comes in at. It all starts with a letter that goes to the office, which one of them answers answers the letter back, they send a questionnaire to them, and they ask them for the legal materials that we use to evaluate the case. In brief, we ask for them to fill out our questionnaire. We ask for the direct appeal brief from the prosecution and the defense, and we ask for the police reports, and we ask for the lab reports if any exist. And we're going to check their answers in the questionnaire with the factual section of the briefs. And then after that, we're going to ask ourselves two questions. Um, which is, and by the way, once all these, once all those documents are gathered, the case is complete, the file's complete. And at that point, it would then be sent to the case analysts to then read over the original materials and they'll prepare reports for me. We'll talk about it. And um, eventually there's nothing else left to learn about the case. We have all the facts on the table. And then we, then we decide we switch hats and then we, I try to convince them why we're going to take it. They try to convince me why we're not or vice versa. And we ask ourselves two questions. Uh, so number one, we ask ourselves, do we believe the innocence claim? And our standard that we use is, is it at least plausible? Is, you know, and the second thing is, do we see a potential route to victory? So you might be persuaded that a client is innocent by what's already on the record, but that's not how you're going to win. You have to come up with something new. So the legal standard is whether this new evidence would have would have probably resulted in a different outcome. So you identify all available investigative lines. That's basically what you're betting on. And then you're going to ask yourself, well, number one, if all these broke right for the for the applicant, would this be enough to bring a newly discovered evidence claim? Um, is is a is is it 
is it, would it be enough? What's the likelihood that any of this is going to break, right? How much time and money would it actually cost to run them down? And that's how we're going to make a decision. If you can't answer yes on both of those questions, you have to pass. So that's our process. I think his is similar, but I'll let Oscar speak for himself. Yeah, it's very similar. Um, one of the few blessings that came out of COVID was that because the court system was shut down and we're a litigation firm, so without a court, we don't have much to do. I was able to finally answer 150 requests for help that we had. And some of them were as old as two years, just sitting there unanswered because I just didn't have time. This is not all that I do by a long shot. This is a side part of my practice. The reason why we have six cases going now, which I've never done more than two at a time, because you can't focus on these reinvestigation cases, is because of COVID, because I had the time to look at these cases. Now I'm kind of screwed because I'm trying, the courts have opened up again, but I want to only work on these cases and I have to now. So it's been a very, very big actual blow to the practice to have to work on this because you don't get paid uh, on these cases. We take them pro bono. But Jeff is right. There has to be a way out. We, we get lots of letters. I'm innocent. Can you help me? I write back, you know, give me some details. One of the most important things is do you have somebody on the outside who has believed in your innocence? Okay. If your mom and dad don't believe you, I'm not going to believe you. Chances are. Okay. So who is the contact person that we're going to be talking to and how can they explain to me why they believe you're innocent? Because I'm not going to be able to visit you in prison all the time. I need somebody here on the outside who's going to be able to help champion the cause for you. And then most importantly is, what did you argue on appeal? Like, if you only really argued like technical legal issues and never brought up, oh, by the way, I didn't do this. Okay, that's going to be a spark for me. But if you've been fighting this case for 10 years and always saying you're innocent, and all I can say, I think Jeff will, will agree with me here, after a while, you can tell. I don't know how it is, but you just get the feeling that this, start, this makes sense. His lawyers didn't do this. He's been fighting and writing letters. David wrote 400 letters, 400 letters before I answered and decided to take the case. And that was only because Another legend in wrongful conviction, Dr. Ruben Hurricane Carter, asked me to get involved in the case. Okay. When I was closing out another exoneration case, I was going through the file, see if I wanted to see anything to keep. I found a letter David had written me two years before I took his case on. Okay. I almost broke down because I just put it in the file. So I can't get no time for this guy. Okay. So it, it's, it's a needle in a haystack. Because many of our cases are dead ends. This is 1994. You know how many witnesses are dead? Just moved? Plus, if they're transient, they're, you know, in the drug community, they're poor. They don't stay at the same address. They're not, you know, they don't file a change of address with the post office. Um, you know, the internet has made it a lot easier to find it. But sometimes you're dealing with, oh, I got this witness. This is a true one. Uh, and Larry McKee. Dude has one eye. That's all we identified the guy. This guy had one eye, okay? And we worked out until we found the one-eyed man in Massachusetts, okay? So, but most of them end as dead ends. The vast majority of these are sitting in my office saying, this is as far as we've gotten and we need something new. So it's very, very difficult. So I want to, yeah, there's a question in the chat, but uh, I want to acknowledge just another fighter fighter for justice in the room that's part of the it could happen to you coalition uh falsely accused himself so working for on, on exoneration um uh long island legend actually um uh, per radio uh frank vetro was with us and i just wanted to acknowledge frank so frank has a frank has a really good book which i'd recommend that you read uh standing on principle which is kind of a play on words because he was a school principal when he was falsely accused, lost his job, and you know held out as long as he could. But yet, I'm not going to tell any more. But uh, you know, he is back. He read the book. He is a school principal again, and still fighting for his innocence uh, many years later. So that's not easy to do. So, so question in the chat, Oscar. Okay, the question in the chat um, in regards to closing cases. Would you, exp would you ex expand how is this related to the private jail 
U.S. system in quotas. Well, all right. So, and by the way, we're not Siamese twins, okay? So I don't necessarily agree with, believe everything he does and vice versa, although we do. He's trying to say I'm more liberal. But um, so my answer... Way. My answer to this question is I, I don't I don't think that the private I don't think the private first of all it's not a private jail system yes there are in New York right I mean that there are some private prisons I haven't heard of a private jail maybe they exist some he'll speak to that but I don't believe that the while I'm against priv prison privatization because it's just simply unseemly it's unethical to profit off of a prison. I don't think I don't I don't perceive that there's any connection between that and wrongful conviction. Um, this, you know, so that's my answer on that one. Uh, Oscar, feel free to differ. Sure. What I, my answer my answer to that is the funding and the payment of private prisons takes money away from attacking the root sources of of the problem. Okay. So, for example, we don't spend a dollar for dollar compared to what we give to the to prosecution to indigent defense okay so we we pay lip service that the constitution provides you a free lawyer and i will tell you right now that the legal aid side does an amazing amazing job they don't get a fair uh fair enough support based upon the caseload that they're given the physical facility that they have and what the other side has. And my son is a DA in Brooklyn. My daughter-in-law is a homicide DA in Manhattan. So I love my DAs. But the fact is, I'm on the board of the Nassau County Legal Aid. And you have to ask yourself a question why the starting salary for a DA in Nassau County is $65,000. And the starting salary for a legal aid lawyer in Nassau County is $54,000. So we've been fighting for parity to at least say, just pay them the same. I mean, that just seems like so basic, right? Shouldn't we just pay them the same? And I want you to understand something, no matter how wealthy you are, no matter how much money you have, you can never match the power of the state, ever. You get an investigator, they got cops. You get an expert, look, on this case that we're talking about, all right, we, we decided to invest this money in this case. The DA walked over to the legislature and in an afternoon, in an afternoon, got $150,000 for experts to combat our experts. All he had to do was walk over to the legislature when they were in session and say, oh, on that CREVAC case, they just filed their experts. They're having a false confession expert and they have a forensic linguist. We need one as well. How much do you need? $150,000. That's it in that session, okay? So we spent whatever we spent, they doubled it. Okay, so please remember that. So privatization of prison is another way to make money off the criminal justice system. It's unconscionable. It should not exist in the United States. I, I encourage all of you to watch uh, 13th a documentary by Ava DuVernay, which showed how the prison system was created to replace slavery. It is still in existence. Okay, that is what's happening here. Prisoners make clothes. They, they get paid, you know, five cents a day. Two dollars a day. What was the rate in prison when you were there? So when I was there, it was sixteen. It was sixteen cents an hour, and if you stayed in that job for ninety days, you get to twenty-two cents an hour, and that's it. Unless you're going to go to unless you're going to go to industry or food service, you know. But even then, I mean, there were four. There were four precious uh, thirty-two cent an hour jobs. Four of them, and that would be after three years on the same job. And don't forget, we just had a case where a judge, I can't remember the state, it was below the Mason-Dixon line, no, no surprise, a judge just went to jail, okay, for sending juveniles to jail in return for money. That's, Pen that, that, that's Pennsylvania, and that was in Luzerne. No, well, there, Pennsylvania that, is another case. But that happened there, too, in Luzerne yeah. County. So that answers the, that's your answer, okay? So those are the ones we know about. All right, we got we have judges sending people to jail when they don't go to jail, or they don't deserve jail, or didn't even commit the crime because they get money back in the private prison system. So, I, I just want to mention one other aspect of the inequities. I agree with I echo out Oscar's statements. I want to just add that uh, in terms of an additional inequity between the uh, public defender's office and the DA's office, 
uh, there is a <clears throat> much bigger, uh, there's a big gap in terms of the overall budget of the offices. It's not, it's not even, it's not unusual for one public defender to represent a hundred people at the same time. That's, that's not uncommon at all. So your students. So what if you were doing 10 classes? What if you, what if you had to carry 20 classes? How could you actually do it? Now imagine if it's a hundred and now think about it's a criminal trial, you know, it's a criminal case. Someone's life is in your hands. Could you give your best effort, you know, like that? So I like to phrase it in terms of um, that, that lens. So important guys. Remember we talked about the importance of a being a Can they hear you? Oh, can y'all, can y'all hear? Oh, so sorry. Um, so those of you who are thinking about a career in law, just remember the, how important both sides are and that the, the right to a defense, especially if you are someone who cannot afford your own, it, some of the most exceptional students in law school go into that because they believe they have the conviction, uh, power of their conviction. Um, and you can see how the, the things are stacked against you. So it's one of the things that we have to work for, for parity in terms of the way we support both sides in our criminal justice system. Oh, oh, but I just wanted to, um, be, we're gonna have time for you guys to ask Jeff a few more questions, but there's one thing we wanna get in. All right, I want, oh. I want to just make one law point and then I'll keep, say, say, but um, in terms of careers, right? Dr. Lake said, said the magic word, right? Uh, careers, word association. So in terms of careers, if this work of appeals to you, you know, there's a lot of careers in this field, obviously lawyer, investigator, paralegal. There's a lot more other careers that are not quite uh, so obvious. Uh, there's on the research level, when advocates like me go to the legislature, and uh, we, we need our stats. So if we don't have research, if we don't have social scientists, you know, if we don't have experts, you know, then, you know, those are being an expert, being a researcher, those are careers on the reintegrative level. There is the role of the psychologist, the role of the sociologist in terms of reintegration within the context of nonprofit organizations, uh, public relations, social media, grant writing, fundraising. And by the way, we, we, we do need you to become DAs yeah. as well. We need, and police officers, okay? Because that's that's where it all starts. We need the mindset that we can do it fairly and protect society. They're not mutually exclusive. And that's been the dialogue that for some reason, you can't do both of these things. That's just false. That's plainly false. So there's lots of fields that you can get involved in depending on what interests you. You could start in one place, a lot of, a lot of, DAs go into criminal defense, a lot of legal aid lawyers become judges, become uh, DAs back or, or private lawyers. It's a great path for everything from law enforcement to a judgeship. I want to add this, uh, you know, certainly investigative journalists uh, is, is another one, uh, documentary, documentarian, uh, making docu-series. Uh, lesser levels of that. Some people are so good at podcasts, you know, they're, they're making income, but that has helped unravel. Uh, so Adnan Saeed is, uh, you know, certainly a significant factor was all the publicity that was obtained through the podcast uh, serial in a similar way, uh, making a murderer, Stephen Avery, Brendan Dassey much better off as a result of publicity around their cases. Haven't won yet, but got a lot more uh, momentum in terms of that. As students, you know, having uh, I was at a high school once and they they had an innocence club at a high school and you could have a student group, you know, here on, on campus, um, you know, that focuses on unlawful conviction. You could do something as uh, on a lower level as you have a movie or documentary night and you're going to pick up pick, uh, you know, wrongful conviction documentaries and it could uh, it could be on that level. Certainly, um, you know, reporters, even if you're not doing investigative journalism. Uh, you know, the key point in time when we need the publicity. Yeah, when there's an exoneration happens, it's a learning moment. And yes, we need to cover that. And we need, you know, a where are they now type of thing to talk about so we can focus in on the uh, reintegrative aspect. That's all great. That has its place. You know what the uppermost level moral wise in terms of media on wrongful conviction cases is the time it's critical is when the injustice is still afoot, when the wrongful conviction is still going on. 
that's when it takes the courage. That's when the media help is uh, is is most critical. So think about all those different things. And to piggyback further, you know, Oscar mentioned becoming DAs or becoming cops. There was a study. Uh, I want to say maybe 20, 2009, 2010. 25% of all the exonerations that happened that year, they had uh, either police or prosecutorial cooperation at one level or another in route of that process. And if you think about the, the rise of the progressive prosecutor, if you think about the conviction review units that uh, have, have arisen uh, in New York, in Brooklyn, 23 people exonerated two and a half years through former Brooklyn DA Ken Thompson's program, including David McCallum, and none of those people, including David, would ever, ever have seen the light of day without a conviction review unit. Uh, in Dallas, Craig Watkins, more than 40 in Philadelphia, uh, Central Park Five was it was agreed to by the DA, although former DA Vance that that was a window dressing of a of a conviction review unit if ever there was one. But yes, he did do the right thing in that case, uh, Philly, where DA Krasner uh, under attack, but more than twenty exonerations, and in all that you, you could never look. Oscar can't get that kind of result. I can't get that kind of result. A large law firm can't, a nonprofit can't. If you are the DA and you have the power of the state, those resources. You know, the what you can, it's breathtaking. It's breathtaking. So we need ethical prosecutors to go in to those positions, you know. Um, and I call on the cops. I call on the honest cops, you know, force the dirty ones out of your profession. I mean, what do they say, right? Uh, you see something, say something, you know. So uh, don't be afraid to review your own work. So we need uh, we need honest people in those professions. Uh, I often tell the cops, you know, you know, you're really the first line of defense in a way. And uh, preventing a wrongful conviction, because if you don't arrest the wrong person, then the train doesn't pull out the station. Good stuff, guys. We heard so much tonight. Um, I would like to have one of our Criminal Justice Club members bring up our little cheesy gifts that we just wanted oh. to thank you so much with, with your Winston buttons. You'll thank see you for, um, oh, from good. the Criminal <laughs> Justice Club. I don't know which one I gave you already. Did I give you that one already? That's great. This is one. Can you, can you read it's the disappearing civil liberties mug as you put hot liquid in the rights disappear i love it similarly there is the supreme court case and when you put hot liquid in the case that wins is the name that shows up with the side that wins well, I, I, want, I want to read the seminal cases here i mean miranda versus arizona you know uh, notorious for all the wrong reasons the dread dread scott versus stanford plessy versus ferguson you know, some of the unremarkable and some Brown versus Board of Education, which overturned Plessy v. Ferguson. This one's in, in they're both incredible. They both are so incredible. You want uh... I'm fine with whichever one you want. Okay, I'll put you have this one already. No, I do not. No, these are, yeah. these are all, these are incredible. Listen, you know what? It's not the size of the gift. It's not the cost, okay? It, it, it's what it is. It's the thought. And look, this is, this was all about civil liberties tonight. And this was all about, you know, we talked, Oscar talked about cases. You know, that's what that's what this is about. That's what wrongful conviction is is about. And some of these decisions Oscar uh, has utilized in his uh, legal arguments for sure. You're gonna start getting all right, I'll take it. That's that's uh that's fine, but To me, to me, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to Oh, 
I'm tall. Okay, and from everyone at home as they begin to exit the Zoom, thank you so much to the speakers. Thank you, Stephanie, Dr. Lake, for this opportunity. Okay, and before you all go, I wanted to say thank you for allowing us to record this via Zoom and making it available to more students and a larger audience. Um, I also want to reiterate one thing. Don't forget the phrase lawyer, lawyer, lawyer. Have a good evening. Bye bye, everyone.